we're talking for sports. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. Good. All right. <laughs> hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Finding the Source. I am Peter Carmichael. I'm with Dr. Ashley Lusky. This will be our last show for maybe a very long time. I am. Uh, we have Gordon Ray tonight, as you all know, and I'll say a little bit about Gordon. Gordon, as you all know, academics have a very tough and rigorous life. And uh, after coming out of a semester in which I had to teach two classes, two whole classes, I now get Gordon an entire year off, entire year, beginning, well, starting Friday. I have two years off. What do you think I'm going to do, Gordon? Uh, guess? Sleep. sleep. No. no, I'm going to I'm going to travel the world and try to find myself. Right? <laughs> it's a good idea, don't you think? No, I shouldn't say that because people are going to think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, good luck with that one. I have lots of different historical things that uh, that I'm going to embark upon. Writing a book. Carrie, Janie, and I are doing a class for great courses, so I will be actually working, uh, but I will also not have the teaching obligations. And this is tough for Ashley because uh, her productivity is going to go down dramatically now that I'm not across the hall from you. Yeah. All those interruptions and distractions that she, keep me going. She very <laughs> subtly, subtly said in a staff meeting yesterday how much she hates to be interrupted when she's writing an email or reading. She's never said any of that. And she said it, it just sort of an off the hand remark, but it was well directed. And the problem is, is by the time I come back to the office, I'll have forgotten all this. And well, I'll, go, I'll go back to my old ways. No, you're like an but. elephant. You never forget those things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Hey, Gordon, we're so pleased to have you with us. I'm going to tell our folks at home a little bit about you. Gordon mm -hmm. Ray is a native of Tennessee. He made the very wise decision to start his undergraduate uh, training at, Ashley, do you know? Indiana. Absolutely, Indiana University. He attended the music school there, which is a music school of renown. He started out as a drummer, as a jazz drummer. No, it's true. No Absolutely, a jazz drummer. Right? He wanted to be another no Buddy way. Rich. Did you not, Gordon? That was my plan. Absolutely, man. So you get there, and I know you told me that you got there, and you're good, but you weren't that good. And and there's so, all these people who are better than me. Yeah. So I figured, let me try something else. Right. So uh, now you finished your undergraduate, though, at IU. Correct? I did. Right. Back in the day, is this pre-Bobby Knight or is, was Bobby Knight? At, it was right at that same time frame. Yeah. Right. Right. Right about that time when you got his start. And then from there, here's where I always get things a little confused. You get an advanced degree and your law degree. And I believe you get them at the same place. And they're both at Harvard. Is that correct? Well, I did my master's at Harvard and my, um, my law degree at Stanford. Oh, gosh, I believe that. That's Wait, right. Do you really? yeah. That's okay. I, I thought I could do it off the top of my head. Thank so you. the folks at home, they know Gordon because he is actually in a long line of lawyers who are sort of wannabe uh, historians. And yeah, uh, Eric Wittenberg. We, Eric Wittenberg, yeah. I'm thinking Alan Nolan. Jim yeah. Matheson Brown, yeah. Hey, we're going to start getting on your turf, right? Well, why can't we start taking some clients? we got the books back here. It looks like a law office. Like we can well, see, I, I think lawyers make excellent historians because we, we operate in terms of we go at things from a neutral point of view. Then we try to marshal all the facts. And then we, we, we reach conclusions based on the facts. And, you know, and then we explain it. So. Yeah, I say that lawyers are delusional like most people, that they yeah. think that they are just absolutely neutral. And I think they're also delusional when they think it's just the facts and only the facts. So I think you're in good company with most historians, right? We, are all, we all somehow think we're above the fray when we're doing our research and writing, but we're all in the same. Well, if we can make it sound neutral. <laughs> make it sound neutral, that's right. Hey, so those at home, they know that, of course, Gordon, uh, he has done the study of the Overland campaign uh, that includes the final volume, and that is uh, Grant's uh, flanking maneuver uh, south of the James and the Appomattox River, uh, and of course attacking Petersburg. That's the last volume, and that is what volume four or five. Gordon? That was number five. Number five, all published by LSU, as is the book that we're going to talk about tonight. And those at home are going to be surprised that this is not, you know, another military or campaign study, right? Instead, right. it is, you know, I got it right here, Black Freedom Fighter, Stephen Swales. And I'm sorry, we don't have, we have the uncorrected page proof. So it's now, and it's been available for how long now, Gordon? It's been out for, for close to a month. Here, I've got the the uh, a hardback copy. Let's how about that? Yeah, without that. Yeah. It, looks, it looks like your page proof Absolutely. copy. Yeah. It just doesn't say page proof on it. So. Yeah. So this is, again, uh, quite a change in your trajectory as a historian. And I'm going to just go ahead and turn it over to Ashley, who will get things started tonight. Gordon, as you know, we've been doing these things together. We're going to go back and forth. 
sure. we encourage the people back home to ask questions. And I'm going to say we really encourage questions that maybe deal with a topic that you don't know about, but certainly you might have some inquiry about reconstruction, right? Uh, if you have to ask about the Overland campaign, <laughs> we might share that with Gordon. Maybe. We maybe, maybe will share that, but we really like to talk about Gordon's book because this is an, an exciting departure, uh, I think, for you mm -hmm. as well. Ashley, go ahead and take it away, please. So I want to get us started, actually, kind of on that point. Why did you swerve over from these traditional campaign studies to a very focused microhistorical, uh, I think you could say, study on Stephen Swales? And how exactly did you uncover his story? Because as you and I were talking before we started, mm -hmm. I didn't know who Stephen Swales was, and I felt kind of embarrassed about it. And you said, well, nobody does. So that made me feel a little better. So so how did you make that transition? What was the choice? And um, and, and how did you pick, pick up all of these pieces and put together this narrative? Well, I mean, you're right. Uh, most of my books have been campaign studies on the wilderness in Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor. And I loved doing those because those were battles, major battles, uh, the big fights between Grant and Lee that no one had ever really looked at really closely before. And uh, so it, I loved doing that. But one thing I did during the course of working on those books was read a lot of letters, a lot of diaries of soldiers and people who were involved in the fighting and, and started to, to get more and more interested in the individuals. Why were they doing this? Uh, what was it like to be there? Um, and those were all burning questions. I wrote a biography. Uh, it's been about 15 years now, I guess, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, on a Confederate soldier from Charleston, Charles Wilden, who uh, was a strange bird. Uh, he was uh, suffered badly from epilepsy and a variety of other ailments. And when he was almost 50, he got pulled into the Confederate Army uh, and dumped into the wilderness in Spotsylvania and became an unsung hero of the attack there on the Bloody Angle. Uh, and uh, several of his contemporaries wrote about him. Uh, he ended up back in Charleston and heard that Sherman was coming that way and tried to save himself by going to Columbia, South Carolina, which turned out to be a big mistake because that's where Sherman went uh, and uh, burned the town down. Uh, and then he died right at the end of the war by, uh, unfortunately, an epileptic seizure and drowned in a mud puddle. Fascinating guy. There. And so that kind of whetted my appetite for biographies. Who are these people anyway? So, um, Gordon, who, who, did LSU publish that book as well? No, that was by uh, Basic Books. Basic right. Books. That's right. Basic what's books what's, what's right. the title of it, Gordon? It's called um, Carrying the Flag, uh, and it's a biography of Charles Wilden, W-H-I-L-D-E-N. And, and uh, you probably said it, and I just missed it. And it's McGowan's Brigade, correct? It was a McGowan's Brigade. Exactly. McGowan's Brigade. He, was with, he was with the 1st South Carolina. Um, but uh, that kind of whetted my, type, my appetite for... Um, you know, for, for biographies. Um, the Swales biography uh, fell into my lap in a, through a very unusual sequence of events. Um, Swales, uh, the, the hero of my, my book, uh, had spent part of his life in King Street, South Carolina. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. I uh, had a home there, his family lived there, uh, his possessions were there. Um, he dies, of course, and in the uh, the house remained until the I think the eighteen of uh, the nineteen thirties, uh, when it was uh, destroyed. Another structure was put in its place, and then in the late nineteen seventies, nineteen seventy eight, that structure was torn down. And on one uh, day in nineteen seventy eight, uh, a couple of uh, uh, young men from King Street, a, a small town in central South Carolina, were driving uh, by that that area. Uh, in their pickup truck and looked over and saw this trunk uh, and a wicker basket. And they went a little bit further than decided, hey, let's go back and look at that thing. Well, they went back and it was gone. It had been picked up by the trash people to be destroyed. Oh, Later that day, one of those young men went by the dump, uh, the town dump. And there uh, on the sidewalk, uh, basically getting ready for destruction was that uh, uh, trunk. He gets out, he opens it up, looks inside and sees it's filled with old papers, uh, documents from the Civil War, uh, letters to people like Wade Hampton, who had been governor of South Carolina, and of course, a Confederate cavalry commander. And he figures, hey, this might be worth something. So he brings it back home and butters look through it and then bring it to the local historical society and sell it for $75. So oh. it's a very good day for them. Um, there, was an, there was an attorney at the uh, historical society um, his name is Bill Jenkinson, uh, and uh, Bill uh, was 
realize the importance of these documents. He copied them all, uh, and then uh, he sent the uh, originals over to the University of South Carolina. Uh, it turns out those were the papers of Stephen Swales. The papers that were sent to the University of South Carolina cannot be found. Uh, I've talked to the archivists there, and there's, they just don't seem to be anywhere. They, they tell me they have some rooms filled with documents but that have never been uh, you know, really uh, uh, indexed. Uh, and so they may be among those. But anyway, we had the copies of the, um, of the documents. Well, a few years ago, uh, my wife, who uh, does some volunteer work for the courts as a guardian ad litem, uh, which is uh, basically helping orphans find places to live, that sort of thing, um, had a, uh, one of her wards was in King Street and had gotten into uh, some accusations had been leveled against him and she needed to get him a lawyer. She knew a local realtor uh, who was from King Street and she asked him, do you know any lawyers in King Street? And he says, yeah, my brother, Billy Jenkinson. Is a, is, a, is a lawyer, why don't you talk to him? So she gets a hold of Billy Jenkinson, the same one who had found those Swales documents. And Billy says, oh, you're Ms. Ray, are you related to, uh, is Gordon Ray your husband? She says, she said, yeah. And he says, well, uh, I'll be glad to do that work for you. Uh, and it won't cost anything, but uh, you gotta get me an appointment with your husband. So she said, okay. <laughs> and so Billy Jenkinson shows up at my office uh, and um, he, has, he has the papers of, Stephen Atkins Swales. And he shows me some of the papers and says, would I be interested in doing the biography? He'd read some of my books and, and thought I'd be the person for it. And I said, my gosh, you bet. This is unbelievable. Uh, because there were some, as I'm sure you know, some 200,000 African-Americans that fought in the American Civil War. And um, to my knowledge, uh, there's only been one other biography of a African-American soldier that's ever been done. Uh, and this just looked like a fantastic opportunity. And then, as I learned, he not only was a soldier in the 54th Massachusetts, but also was the first African-American to ever be commissioned as a line combat officer in the U.S. military, and then was elected as a senator to the South Carolina legislature during Reconstruction, and then was selected by his peers as the speaker pro tempore of the South Carolina Senate, which is one of the top positions and became a major figure during Reconstruction, um, I thought, wow, I mean, I can't pass this up. Right. And so that's that's what got me into all of this. And uh, I worked on it back and forth. I'm still a practicing lawyer. Uh, and so that uh, slowed me down some, but I guess I benefited from the pandemic uh, because uh, this past year, um, you know, all of the legal work is on Zoom <laughs> and things like that. So I was able to stay home and really put all of this together. Um, I got a lot more documents at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History and, of course, the National Archives and, uh, and other places and was able to put together Swales' box. Can, can you just tell us about the nature of those documents? Are they professional, personal, and mixed? What, what were they? All sorts of things. First, a lot of them uh, dealt with his military uh, times, uh, and they're the kinds of documents you, I guess you would see in the compiled service records. You know, his, uh, various commissions and things like that. Uh, also, some of the correspondence that went back and forth between himself and involving other people who were actually trying to help him get um, uh, commissioned. Uh, a lot of that material is in there. Uh, he uh, worked with the Freedmen's Bureau for a few years, and a lot of those documents are in there. He was extremely active. He would mediate between the, the uh, freed, formerly enslaved population and the uh, former plantation owners, basically, uh, to figure out salaries, uh, land titles, uh, schooling systems, all sorts of things. Sure. Um, and also in his papers, uh, uh, has there are several documents that deal with a period when he was in the South Carolina legislature. Uh, and uh, the a lot of the white supremacist organizations, the Redeemers, uh, wanted to assassinate him. Uh, and uh, one group uh, almost succeeded. Uh, and so there's a fair amount of correspondence between him and uh, Wade Hampton, who became the governor of South Carolina uh, at the end of Reconstruction um, and uh, just all sorts of stuff. And then, uh, fascinating enough, uh, during the later part of his life, uh, various people within the 54th Massachusetts in Boston um, were uh, soliciting the recollections of soldiers who fought during the war. And uh, he wrote out a lot of his recollections, including his recollections of the big fight there at, uh, at Battery Wagner. Could, could you get us started with his life prior to the Civil War? 
Where yeah. did he live? Like, what kind of guy was he? And then we could talk a little bit about the 54th. And I think it'd be interesting to your, your thoughts and how it compares to, to the movie Glory and how we think about that. So, yeah, give okay. us first sort of a snapshot of who is this guy prior to the Civil War? Okay, well, he's, he's born in 1832 uh, in a little town in Pennsylvania. It's called Columbia, Pennsylvania, right on the Susquehanna River. And it's a terminal uh, for the um, Underground Railroad. So there was a significant movement of African-Americans through the town. A lot stayed. And there was a whole part of town called Toe Hill that was the, uh, the African-American section. Um, it was well situated so you could get to other major towns fairly easily, either on the rivers, uh, uh, railways, or, or turnpike systems. Um, his mother uh, was perhaps uh, white or perhaps mulatto. And it depends on which census record you read. <laughs> so she definitely was light-skinned either way you cut it. Uh, his dad uh, was probably an escaped slave from Maryland. Uh, that seems to be the picture. Uh, and his father was probably mulatto and probably much darker skinned. Uh, and, and there are some records that talk about him as black, others that talk about him as mulatto. Uh, Swales wrote about it later on when he was trying to get commissioned. Uh, and uh, the letter that he wrote to the War Department said that he was his mother was white and his father was one quarter black because one of his father's Grant his one of his father's grandparents had been um, African American, and so Swale said that would make him one eighth black. But whatever the reality, uh, he always um, identified himself as black, and that's why he ultimately, of course, joins the fifty fourth Massachusetts. Whatever. Uh, the interesting thing about growing up in Columbia, uh, Pennsylvania, is that even though it had been a fairly quiet town, it got caught up in the big race riots of, of, in 1834 that took place in New York and Philadelphia in a variety of spots. Uh, brutal, brutal riots with uh, um, white protesters marching through the black part of town, burning houses, firing off guns, threatening people. And of course, little little swales being two and a half years old, hiding under his bed. We can we can envision what that was all about. <coughs> went on for uh, several weeks uh, and ultimately his family leaves town, uh, goes to a quieter town nearby that actually has a lot of Quakers uh, uh, in it and, and is uh, less, uh, le less violence. <clears throat> they end up finally in New York, uh, in Elmira and in Cooperstown. Uh, and Swales as a young man ends up getting, uh, he, by the way, goes through school. He's quite literate, uh, very well-spoken, very light-skinned, which serves him very well as time goes on. Look, he could actually be mistaken for white, according to several people who knew him quite well. Um, ends up working in a hotel as a waiter. Uh, and when that hotel burns down, uh, he ends up working on one of the canals there in New York. Um, and uh, Civil War at this point is broken out. And uh, in early 1863, in April, he volunteers for the 54th Massachusetts. Um, as you know, the 54th Massachusetts was the brainchild of uh, John Andrew, governor of, of Pennsylvania, uh, who was a strong abolitionist. Uh, and uh, he finally got permission uh, from the War Department to raise a black volunteer regiment in the North. Uh, the 54th is made up of volunteers uh, from the North. Uh, large numbers of them are uh, African-Americans who had always been free. So, some were, were African Americans who had been enslaved but had escaped. So you get you get both mixes. Um, Jordan, it was really that, championed. I'm sorry. Go ahead. On that point, um, what was the nature of the the relationship between the African Americans in the 54th, the ones who had been always freed, and then the ones who had been escaped slaves? And I guess that's where maybe part of Pete's question about glory and the accuracy of that might come in. Is there yeah. a combative, especially a class based? Um, out of nature between them, you know, do the, the, the always free blacks kind of look down upon the, mm -hmm. the former enslaved? Can you shed some light on that before we move on? Yeah, in the 54th, uh, obviously, it, it, you went a long way if you were literate, if you could read, write, if you could speak, if you could speak well, and if you could deal with white people. Uh, that regiment, uh, even though the enlisted soldiers were African American, the officers were all white. Uh, and so you had to deal with the white hierarchy. Swales met all of those requirements. Um, he was used to moving in both worlds. And so the uh, colonel of the 54th Massachusetts, Robert Gould Shaw, 
uh, within a few weeks, um, selected Swales to be a sergeant. It's not a commissioned officer, but it's an officer. Uh, and, uh, and he was commissioned or he was selected probably because he fit that mold that they were looking for. And also because he was very, very light skinned. And that gets commented on by many people. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. The um, is there any evidence that you've seen um, that within the 54th Massachusetts that we know that they're mostly free blacks, um, and that we don't know that there can often be a hierarchy within a right. American community based upon skin color. So, mm -hmm. did you ever get any sense of, of tensions or of this hierarchy based on skin color? I, I, yeah, I, I hadn't seen anything in any of the, the letters or documents from the regiment that really talks about that. But when you look at who was made, who, who, who were the people who were advanced within the regiment, it's clear that, uh, you know, the more you look like a white man, the better off you were. Right, right. An interesting interaction had to have taken place. And again, we don't know a lot about this. I know the movie Glory, which I happen to think is an excellent film. Um, the movie Glory uh, touches on it. And that is when the 54th Massachusetts comes down to, to South Carolina, uh, there are the, the first South Carolina colored and second South Carolina colored regiments, which were made uh, entirely pretty much from freed slaves. So these are people who'd been free only for a few months <laughs> and uh, were basically illiterate uh, and had never had never been free. Uh, and uh, so the cultural gulf or gap between the people of the 54th and the people of, say, the first South Carolina colored was huge. Um, they don't talk about it much. There's very little in any of the documentation uh, where they talk about it, but you can only imagine how um, I suspect that the men of the 54th South, uh, North, uh, 54th Massachusetts were uh, viewing the um, newly freed slaves making up the... Well, they, yeah, I think, Gordon, you, you point to something that have, people have criticized Glory um, for exaggerating the number of enslaved or recently slave people right. in the ranks. And, you know, I think that one, obviously, you need to give any... You need to give people uh, some latitude for yeah. creative creativity when you're doing a movie. But I thought it also served a valuable historical point reminding us that not all African Americans in the Civil War era were the same. That they came from the same background, and they had. I know uh, Denzel Washington called the one African American. He called them snowflake. So like, yeah. uh, there was just sort of your know, composite uh, free black soldier who would have been in the Fifty uh, Fourth Massachusetts. Right. So you know, I you know people are gonna. And I've already heard some things. People fussing about the movie and its inaccuracies, and that it really didn't capture the essence of the Fifty Fourth. But you point to what. We need to be reminded of and the black community at any time even today is not singular that there's tensions and divisions and disagreements amongst them and i think your point is right i suspect that the 54th massachusetts that the rank and file had a very difficult time connecting with those regiments that came from recent runaways they mm -hmm. came from very different social world worlds your, your skin color uh it certainly might be an entry point and, and maybe some degree of fostering a connection but at the end of the day they are as strangers to each other. And so I yes. think like a really good point about that. Yeah, no, and I think, I think that definitely was the case. Again, it doesn't come out that much in the documentation. You just don't see people, uh, no people talking that. about it. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Shaw's letters, yeah. uh, Blue Eyed Child of yeah. Fortune for those at home, Blue mm -hmm. Eyed Child of Fortune published by University of Georgia Press. And uh, it's been a long time since I've read them. I think it's interesting that we know that Shaw had some reservations about emancipation. Right. I think those reservations were more on military terms, the fear that yeah. so many had that if uh, if slavery was destroyed, if emancipation came, mm -hmm. that runaway slaves would flock to Union armies and that they would actually be an impediment uh, right. to military efficiency and, and operating in the field. And I think that was some of Shaw's reservations. Yeah. I don't know. I should know. Kevin... Levin is working on a biography of Matthew Gomeshaw. Yeah, Kevin Kevin is, and I'm sure it'll be excellent. I, I think the world of Kevin. Yeah. One, yeah. one thing that's interesting about Shaw and about that entire 54th uh, regiment, uh, as it was getting raised, a lot of the uh, um, you know more visible 
um, abolitionists uh, were very much in favor of it. I mean, Frederick Douglass went, went out on the road <laughs> to, uh, to recruit basically for the 54th Massachusetts uh, and did a, a lot of his other peers. Uh, and, you know, the arguments were that, you know, this is an opportunity for the black population to stand up and fight for their freedom. Um, and uh, he made that point quite strongly. A sticking point was the fact that the officers were going to be white men. Uh, and so that was sort of, you know, that wasn't like white masters over the slaves, but it had some some ingredients of that. Right. And uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the abolitionists uh, and, and the spokesman basically said, well, you know, it ain't perfect, but we, we need to sell it to the masses and right. it's going to be more palatable uh, to the to the northern population if at least at this stage the officers are white because mm-hmm. uh, this is a revolutionary thing to do and uh, um, basically frederick douglas and others said okay you're right i mean this is a practical problem how do we sell this right. um i was fascinated by the way when the 54th massachusetts left to go to war to go to south carolina uh, it paraded through boston and there was a huge um, a parade a gathering and people were along the way uh, cheering and uh it was uh, extremely positive, but there were a lot of people who weren't happy about, uh, you know, a thousand armed black men marching through town. And uh, a lot of the newspapers, particularly the uh, Irish American newspapers were very down on it. And, uh, you know, it came out with stories about how, you know, the Confederates won't have to look for these black regiments because they can smell them 20 miles away. I mean, brutal, uh, nasty stuff. Uh, and But that's how they looked at it. Uh, I think there was still this real, um, uh, a lot of the, the racial uh, animosity in the North as well. Uh, it, it, it is, and I just want to underscore that by saying, you know, we need to remind ourselves that what uh, fueled that racial ideology by the Irish is a belief that the African Americans were responsible for the cause of this war. Exactly. The burden of this war was falling falling disproportionately on them, on the Irish, that they were having to go off and to and mm-hmm. to fight this thing. Now, I don't know if that's an accurate perception that they had, but I think, you know, one thing about the movie Glory, you get this sense, do you remember they have the, the sergeant is Irish? Yeah. He's Irish, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? And I remember Shaw says something to the effect, well, he's, a, he's Irish, right? And they don't think too kindly about right. black folks. And so yeah, it's undis- undisputably true, but I think we get into a dangerous area where we start to say, oh, the Irish had this predisposition toward racism or toward hating black ones. That predisposition came out of the place and the world that they lived in. I mean, the New York City draft riots speak to that. Yeah. I was going to say the draft riots in New York are a big example of that. If you think about it, the big draft riots in New York were taking place while the 54th Massachusetts was yeah, doing his glorious things in South Carolina, basically a battery Wagner and just afterwards. I mean, this yeah. was in July of 1863. Yeah. And um, the uh, a lot of, I mean, there were African Americans that were that were murdered uh, during the draft riots. Uh, schools burned down. I mean, a lot of it was focused against the African American population. And the articulated reason was was that they're the cause of this war, and that's why we're having to. That's why we're getting drafted. Yeah. yeah. No but we're more, di- but but Gordon, we're more divided today than what we've ever been. That's... And we're on the brink of civil war. Actually, did you know that? Well, we we don't have a civil war yet. So I have a hard time sleeping at night sometimes. Thank God I'm going on leave, man. I got to get the hell out of this country before it just all falls apart. I tell you, sleep for a year. That'll really yeah, that's that's, that's what I'll do. G- Gary Gallagher gave a talk. You were there yeah, as well. It was at Cemetery for November nineteenth, and I was so pleased to hear him remind people about the history, the long history that extends beyond just two weeks, and. Uh, and what we hear today, of course, is so dislocated from reality. And of course, then when it uses history, or I should say abuses history, yeah, it's, it's pretty pathetic. But that's right. where we are with the media, I would say. Uh, can you just quickly here, and then I'll, uh, I'll actually jump in. So um, do you have any wartime letters from Swales? Like, I guess what I'm trying to lean toward here, yeah. if, if any sense of uh, his radicalization, I guess that's what I would call it. Yeah. But, yeah. Not not really from wartime letters, but we ha- we can see what he did. Um, uh, obviously, he was involved in the the heart of the fighting there at Battery Wagner. He ends up he left some impassioned accounts. I quote him from them in my book uh, as he's up there on the parapets. Uh, of course, Shaw is killed right away, and uh, uh, he ends up with two white. Uh, captains, uh, both of them are killed, but he manages to save himself. But it's a it's it's a brutal scene. 
um, uh, for the next two months, uh, the African-American uh, regiments, uh, mainly the 54th Massachusetts, are used as uh, laborers. They have to dig the ditches, the, the entrenchments, and, uh, and they are wondering, well, why do we have to do this while the white regiments are sitting back there smoking cigars or whatever they're doing? Um, so there was some resentment for that. Then, of course, the draft riots were going on, and they were saying, here we are risking our lives for this nation, and there's riots, and Black people are being killed. What's going on here? And then there was the pay problem, and Swales becomes a major spokesman uh, with respect to that. Uh, the soldiers have been promised uh, $13 a month. Um, that's what white men got, and that's what the black soldiers have been promised. Uh, they hadn't been paid now, and months had passed since they joined the regiment. They hadn't received a penny. Uh, the paymaster comes down uh, and uh, gathers them together and says, well, you're not going to get $13 a month. We'll give you $10 a month. And oh, by the way, we're going to hold back three extra dollars uh, for your, you know, your, your, your clothes and stuff. So you'll get $7 a month. And uh, the regiment said, basically, no way. We want our $13. They refused to take anything until they got their $13. And to their credit, the white officers joined that boycott and said, we aren't going to take any more pay either until our black brethren are paid what they should be. Swales plays a big part in this. Uh, he helps organize it. He sends in letters, uh, and he's a major spokesman. And ultimately, uh, it takes about another year, uh, they get paid and they get back pay. But uh, it was one heck of a fight. So he's distinguishing himself as a uh, somebody who's who's fighting strongly for the rights of the African-Americans. So even though he's not writing a diary or anything like that, you can see what he's doing. Um, and he remains a leader. They end up in Florida. There's the Battle of Alusti. Uh, and he ends up getting shot in the head, badly wounded, um, uh, fortunately not killed. Uh, but uh, at the end of that battle, his new colonel, Shaw having been killed, but, but his new colonel, uh, writes a letter of basically of commendation. And he's reported the battle. He singles out Swales and says that Swales has acted commendably and bravely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then recommends that he be commissioned as a officer yeah, in the military. And we can talk we about that in a bit, too. But uh yeah, can we can we delve a little bit more deeply into that? Because that's that's such a huge moment um, to yeah. have a black man be receive a commission, which, of course, as you highlight in your book, means that you can technically work your way up the ladder to the point of a black man then having rank over a white man, which is yeah, heaven forbid, right? Problematic. So, yeah. so what is it in the way you describe it in your book? Obviously, he's earned this through meritorious service at Battery Wagner and then also at Alusty, but it almost seems like he's kind of a not a pet project, but kind of an example that they're mm -hmm. trying to make of, of him. And is that, do you think that's because of, again, the lightness of his skin and he kind of fits a certain mold? He's, he is the ideal soldier. He's playing the ideal soldier because he is educated. He can fit in both worlds. Is that really what, what throws him over the top from other black think, soldiers in the unit? I think that plays a big part. And again, in, as you mentioned in my book, I spend several pages taking a look at the correspondence going back and forth between Governor Andrew, who jumps in on Swales's behalf, on Swales's colonel, uh, on other members of the uh, African-American community and, and white community who support him strongly. Yeah. And then, of course, correspondence from the War Department, which is saying, no, nah, we can't do it. And when you look at that correspondence, the War Department says, I mean, it's not in code language. It's right out there. It says we can't commission him because he's got African blood. Those are the very terms. Um, and what finally turned the corner uh, was not only all of these commendations from various people, but also it was pointed out very strongly. Well, he may have some African blood, but he looks like a white man. You wouldn't know it if, if, if you know, if you, if you didn't know it ahead of time, you wouldn't recognize it. Uh, and uh, that apparently is what uh, what got him through, uh, which is which is a sad state of affairs, but that was the reality. And he ends up getting commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, there had been, by the way, just to straighten out the record, uh, some other African Americans who had been commissioned, uh, uh, but that was they'd all been commissioned not in a combat role. It had always been either as a preacher or a medical side or as a recruiter. He okay. gets he gets commissioned in as a combat officer. Uh, and uh, there is the risk that he would end up commanding white troops, but he never did. Yeah, that never and happened. What is the response then amongst other troops who were passed over in favor of him, or you know, other white officers of 
black units to see that he has received a commission. Yeah, uh, as, so far as I can tell, uh, it was pretty good support. Um, yeah. The black, the uh, African American newspapers were uh, you know, excited about this, uh, and um, uh, other people in his regiment were were excited. Wrote letters into various newspapers. I think I quote several of them in my book, um, and. Uh, uh, I, I didn't anywhere see any one say, no, this never, never should have happened. Yeah. Uh, though I'm sure many people felt that way. Uh, sure. And sure. I follow, by the way, just to, just to, to tie that off uh, at the end of the book in my epilogue, uh, I talk a little bit about uh, what happened with African-Americans in the military afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a pretty story. Again, uh, there were no African-Americans permitted to um, had outfits that had white soldiers in them for a very long time until well into the century. Uh, and then there were, there were only uh, percentages of blacks that could be in regiments, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't really until the Vietnam War that most of that broke down and you ended up getting um, something of a, of a level of equality. You know, uh, Gordy, something that, that you said here is, yeah, the, the story it, it feels very depressing to us. I, I would just again push back a, a little bit, and that is that you know, our desire or um, expectation uh, that there be some kind of racial equality. Um, I think that that, of course, is utterly unreachable. And I'm sometimes I'm kind of um, sort of just if I find it curious why that becomes the end goal when that, of course, was so far out of reach, because it goes back to what you said earlier, uh, Gordon. Putting a black man in a union uniform, carrying a musket and fighting for the union cause. I mean, there's not a betting man in this country in 1859 after John Brown Ray says that yeah, that's a possibility. So I, I think, you know, I think your point is well taken. I, mean, I, I don't even know we need to, I mean, yeah, it'd be great to hear from Swales, but if we don't, I mean, your point is, you know, at Fort Wagner fighting, you know, uh, what makes a man, if you're a black dude, is wearing a union uniform and shooting that gun. And that's a radical moment. And uh, yeah. I, I'm afraid in this moment in which we live, and where we are uh, just, it seems relentless and pointing out it's on Twitter all the time. And it's, I, that's why I got off Twitter because historians who I respect, who I find, I, they seem like very different people to me. And what they do is they just sort of target practice on historical figures who don't live up to our expectations. I'm not sure what comes out of that or what, I, well, I know what comes out of it. It's just a uh, uh, sort of self-righteousness that leads us nowhere. And, and so I think your point is, you know, this guy carrying a musket, mm -hmm. what happened there, we can't underestimate that. We got Kevin. Kevin Levin is with us, or he, he's got something. He, yeah. I can't see that. It's a little far. Yeah, yeah this right. goes like, back a little bit further in the conversation, um, saying that there's some evidence to suggest that Robert Gould Shaw favored light-skinned fugitive slaves that entered Union camps in the Shenandoah Valley when he was still with the 2nd Massachusetts, uh, right. so before he assumed command of the 54th. Right. Kevin, if maybe he can write something here and if he has, I mean, obviously it'd be conjecture on Kevin's part, but I'd be interested in it. Why Shaw did that, I suspect. I mean, it's hard to know. Yeah. Well, Kevin, if you're still with us, maybe you have a theory <laughs> about, about that. Um, yeah. I think, Pete, just to go off of the, the previous point you just made, kind of bringing us into the reconstruction years, which so much of your book does focus on. Yes. Uh, again, I, I think we can't assume that history always moves in a straight, you know, A to Z line, that it's just going to be a continuous stream of progression. And uh, what you highlight with Swales is that I think contrary to a lot of people would stress now about Reconstruction is that there were these extremely promising moments, such as when Republicans create this new constitution for the state of South Carolina, which Swales is instrumental in. Yeah, right. And when he becomes, you yeah. know, a, a senator and, and a representative, yeah, yeah. Um, these are shining moments. And it's not like all of that just gets wiped away forever when the redeemers come in and literally threaten his life, which is a horrific moment. Um, it's not going to move steadily in progression, but yeah. there were huge light points that yeah made progress that even if that foothold wasn't fully retained at the time, mm -hmm. that the echoes of that are going to play out in the future. And I think, again, when people think of reconstruction, oh, it's not a failure, nothing was achieved. I don't think Swales would ever make that claim himself, despite being literally chased out of the state. Yeah. I mean, he made some interesting advancements. We can talk about those, although I have to say most of them were erased <laughs> at the end of reconstruction. Uh, and well, we maybe his, his, per his personal ones, but I think, you know, overall, he, he leaves footprints that other people take up, Absolutely. you know, years later. Yeah. He does. And, and two things about him that always strike me. First, how does someone like him, who's 
experienced the horrors of of you know of racial hatred as a child mm -hmm. uh that and that continues throughout his life yet he remains positive and he keeps moving forward he keeps right. trying to make things better he doesn't stop he doesn't quit he doesn't give up mm -hmm. um i mean to me that's a, that's a very very strong personality mm -hmm. but the other side of him that's absolutely fascinating is is that I think he was able to make the kind of advancements that he did because he could really work in both worlds. He yeah. could work, he could, he could move in the white world and he could move in the black world and he could, he could be in between the two. And you see, you really see that right after the war, uh, he joins the Freedmen's Bureau uh, and he ends up in some different parts of South Carolina, but ultimately ends up in the area of King Street, South Carolina, Williamsburg County, which is a rural county in the interior of the state. Um, and uh, he worked with the, there with the Freedmen's Bureau, sort of mediating between the white population, the plantation owners, et cetera, and the freed slaves. And he uh, does a fantastic job. He's fair, and he wins the respect of both. Uh, Gordon, could you just tell, for those people who might not know what the Freedmen's Bureau did, yeah, you the said they mediating. What, what, what issues are being mediated? Right. The Freedmen's Bureau was set up. Actually, it, it went through some evolutions, but uh, its main purpose uh, right after the war was to uh, ease the route of the freedmen, the freed former slaves, uh, uh, into a regular society. Uh, and so they worked on setting up schools to help educate. Uh, a big thing, obviously, was to set up wage jobs uh, because the slaves had never been paid wages before. And so there had to be um, contracts worked out between landowners and the freed slaves uh, and uh, uh, find ways that they could have farms so that they could have land. Um, basically, take care of all those different uh, areas uh, of, of life uh, so that people who had been enslaved for their entire life and now were being told, OK, go out and, and, and take care of yourself. Well, <laughs> what do we what do I do? <laughs> And uh, that was what the Freedmen's Bureau got into. Swales was deep into trying to ease that transition. Um, and he, he would set up mediations, actually, uh, between the property owner and the former slave to figure out how much will you get paid? Uh, how long do you have to work? What, prop what piece of property can you have? Uh, and if they couldn't agree, uh, he would then ultimately mandate what it would be. And he had armed forces to back him up if need be, but generally he was able to bring it together. So can you, Gordon, real quickly, and again, I'm, I'm like my students, I, I wasn't a careful reader. Uh, you, you, his mediation, did Swales, when you talk about land, did he ever advocate for, because the Freemans Bureau didn't have the power to do this, from this is what I'm gonna ask. Did he ever call for a redistribution of land? Did he ever say, we need to take land from this former slaveholder, this former Confederate, and hand it over to, to free blacks. I suspect he never did that. Correct? No, but he, no, but he would uh, basically say to landowners, and, and we have some documents that show him doing this. Basically, you know, this man's worked on your property for the last twenty-five years, uh, and uh, he needs a place to live, and you've got all of this land, etc. And I think it would only be fair for you to give him right. some. Well, I, I, I think that's one other reason that swales was able to function in that world so well that goes beyond skin color here and i'm reminded of edisto edisto island which is not yeah. i mean that's not so far from y'all there's this incredible document from a handful of freedmen writing to o. o howard head of the freedmen's bureau right. i believe they signed with their mark they're illiterate but what's of course i think so powerful and uplifting is that they've come together these free blacks they are petitioning so they're engaging in political action and they're making the point to howard and this is going to relate to swales as well and there's a conservatism here and that conservatism is the faith in wage labor these free blacks and edisto say <clears throat> these wages are not getting it done the labor and working conditions are too harsh that these men who own this land were our former slave owners and that it, this is an unworkable condition. We need to own land. And of course, Howard was basically pray to Jesus and all will be okay. Just forgive your enemies, which of course was, I'm sure, disheartening as hell. And I think here's the same point about Swales. I mean, he is a black freedom fighter, but here we see his conservatism. And it's understandable that and, and with the Freemans Bureau, he can't come out and say, we need to take this land and redistribute it. But we know that 
that's not the great panacea to reconstruction for black mm -hmm. folks. But telling a black man to take a wage, I mean, that is a, um, you know, a future of virtual impoverishment. So I, I'm not trying to be critical of Swales. I'm just trying, I think, yeah. my think, is that that's one reason why he worked well in the white world. He's not out there saying, you know what, Freedom's Bureau, this is actually going to perpetuate a working condition that is, I'd say, coercive base, right? So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and you could see him, and I mean, he was elected mayor of King Street. Um, and uh, he actually studied law uh, right after the war and uh, became an attorney. Back then, you didn't have to go to law school to do that kind of study. You read the law and then you right. become an attorney. He became an attorney and he set up a law firm there in King Street. And the law firm was himself and his law partner. And his law partner was a white man, a former Confederate who had fought in battles against Wales. Oh, wow. So, I mean, <laughs> this is a guy who is, you know, really standing for all interests. Uh, but at heart has has obviously the interest of the of the black population at, at the top of his list. He's elected uh, uh, to be a representative in the uh, Constitutional Convention that South Carolina holds in 1867. Uh, blacks can vote in this election, and that's why he's elected. No question about it. But uh, and he helps put together a very progressive um, constitution uh, for South Carolina. And then he's elected to the Senate. Uh, and once he gets into the Senate, his peers, the other senators, select him as the speaker pro tempore of the Senate, which is one of the most powerful positions. Right. Um, so he then becomes a major actor uh, throwout Reconstruction. Uh, Can you just uh, give any idea why, again, I apologize if I miss this. So the 54th Massachusetts, they obviously get mustered out of service and they yes. go back to Massachusetts. Oh, I don't know where they mustered out. Kevin's here. Maybe he can tell us. They mustered out, in, in, out. Even though their companies are from all over the place, they go back to Boston, right? Yeah, they go back to Boston. They go uh, back to Boston. Okay, so he then, obviously, they decided to come back to South Carolina. Yeah. So in a sense, he's yes. a carpet bagger. Well, that's what they called him. Too. Yeah, they they him with the, yeah. Well, he got hit two ways. One way, they called him a carpet bagger, obviously, because he wasn't a South Carolinian. Uh -huh. um, and uh, secondly, he had fought with the Union forces that marched through South Carolina. Yeah. And one thing I didn't mention when we were talking about the Civil War is uh, toward the end of the war, and actually in April of 1865, um, uh, there was a, a raid by uh, Potter called Potter's Raid. Uh, the 54th Massachusetts was one of the uh, regiments involved in Potter's Raid that passed within a few miles of King Street uh, and was tearing up railroads and doing a variety of things. And so um, later, obviously, some of the particularly uh, white population was concerned about having a former uh, union officer who was involved in Potter's raid, which was right there in that part of South Carolina, um, wielding much power. Um, but you don't see uh, any uh, complaints about that during his lifetime. It's afterwards when some people wrote some books that they, uh, they raised that issue. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. I, we were talking about this before we we signed on, but the fact that he is eventually chased out of South Carolina, literally, because there are threats in his life, and he does almost lose his life uh, that one night, you know, returning home from from a meeting, um, right. trying to gather some of these Republicans, Black Republicans, together uh, to rally the party. Um, this is after the Democrats have taken back over the state, of course, and and the so-called Southern Redeemers have. Uh, right you know, changed, changed up a lot about law and society from how it was when Swales was in power. But the fact that he, he goes to DC to try and plead his case and tries to plead for protection and equality and the federal government is of course, just kind of tired of enforcing these things at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And practically, you know, it's just not possible. Uh, but the fact that he then comes back to South Carolina so many times after that, after mm -hmm. he's told, if you don't leave the state permanently within 10 days, and then he does leave to go to DC the first time, um, you know, we're, we're going to kill you. He comes back numerous times. He leaves his wife and his kids there by yeah. themselves, and they're apparently totally safe. But the fact that then he tries coming back and running uh, for political election again at some point, yeah, I mean, that, that takes guts, the fact <laughs> that right. he's doing that. Right. Yeah. Um, and I assume when he makes those trips back that maybe there's been a turnover in the population who initially threatened his life. I mean, why aren't there more attempts on his life? He keeps popping up, the newspapers record it, he's back in town. 
why can he do this? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. During the Reconstruction period, uh, which which ends with the election of um, of Wade Hampton uh, there in 1878, um, I'm sorry, 1876, there's a, um, a increasing violence against African-American politicians and leaders and against white politicians who side with the uh, African-Americans. And it's just brutal assassinations. I mean, it's, it's killing. Uh, and uh, there's, there's huge, um, you know, um, armed groups that go to polling stations and, and threaten people's lives. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's horrendous. And uh, I was actually surprised at the level of uh, the horror of, of how much physical violence there was uh, perpetrated mm -hmm. on the black population. Obviously, we all know there were some, but I, but to, deal, to delve into it and look at the details right. uh, is... Uh, and, Gordon, I, I'm just going to add in there, it's important to note, it was also perpetrated against white Southern Republicans. Like this is, yes. I mean, what you've described here, this is the Democratic Party and they got a paramilitary outfit and it's the Klan. Yeah. It's, it's for the okay. Democratic Party. That's that's what they're doing here. They're going after white folks who are unionists and Republicans. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, both scalawags, carpetbaggers, and blacks <laughs> are all all in the uh, in the scope. Right. Swales right. manages to get through that unscathed until uh, after he's been driven out of the government, and then he's campaigning in 1878. And um, uh, and as you said, uh, he's a, a group of uh, basically kidnaps him uh, as he's returning uh, or driven out of a rally. Uh, and uh, one of his friends is shot twice there when they get back to King's Tree. Uh, he manages to save his life, but then he's given the next day or so a uh, ultimatum that says basically uh, leave or you're dead. Uh, and he decides, OK, I'm getting the heck out of here. He leaves. His family stays there. Um, and I've seen nothing that says they were ever threatened. Um, he does come back uh, multiple times over the next several years of uh, uh, campaigns uh, for African-American politicians, um, uh, actually runs for office, tries to get uh, uh, elected instead of Robert Smalls getting elected, but uh, he doesn't do so well on that. Uh, and he actually represents Robert Smalls as Smalls' lawyer in an election that Smalls loses. Um, so he's quite quite active in all of those things. Uh, and I and good question you asked. Well, why didn't they shoot him then? I don't know. Uh, and the other interesting thing about that, though, is, is that every time he comes back to South Carolina, it's in the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, and I quote some of those in my book. Uh, uh, the local papers uh, write articles. Swales is back. He's rabble rousing again. He's causing <laughs> trouble. You know, that, that evil man is back here uh, uh, getting all of the, the African-Americans upset. Uh, so he was he was a continual pretty much target. He dies in 1900 uh, and uh, basically disappears off the face of the earth. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, he is one of those unsung heroes, uh, but he never, never gave up the fight. Yeah. Should we ask um, the question that I'm just curious? Yeah. I can sort of see it. <laughs> um, so this is from uh, Hampton Newsom, um, another historian. Uh, Thanks so much. Curious how you compare working on a bio project like this one and the campaign narratives you have written. Um, also, any other projects in the pipeline? And that kind of gets to a, a question, too, that I wanted to ask about choosing a, a micro historical methodology and choosing swales. What, what are the, the merits to that in terms of the, the lens of, of history that you're able to show through this one uh, relatively narrow story, but it can speak to much broader issues? Um, I, I think maybe that's where this, um, this question is kind of going as well. Right. I don't know. I really enjoyed working on Swales' biography. I got to say, I really thank Billy Jenkinson <laughs> for bringing me into that. And by the way, Billy has been a real supporter. He's helped me get some documentation, et cetera. Uh, and um, he has he managed, managed to get a marker put up at the site of Swales' former home. Sure. He managed to get a, a ceremony with a big uh, obelisk at Swales' mm -hmm. grave site. Uh, and uh, he's been he's been quite active in helping to um, bring Swales' memory back to contemporary right. memory. Right. Uh, it's impressive. But in any event, I, I working on a biography like that for me uh, just reminded me every day that Civil War, Reconstruction, all of these big historical events are made out of people. Right. And uh, it and if you follow one person through it, you learn a tremendous amount. 
particularly if it's somebody like Swales, um, as I said, I was just astounded at the, his, his consistency, uh, his, you know, the horrible things would happen, but he kept going. Uh, and he, his goal always was to try to basically, you know, get equality or the same treatment for the black populace uh, as the white populace had. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was thoughtful about it, fair about it. Other people did it in different ways. Other people had different agendas. Um, but to follow one person through it, I think, is an interesting way to, you know, to thread that needle of different, different movements, different times, and understand them. Gordon, I think that, you know, that's what's so valuable about this book. And I want to just elaborate on, on something you suggested earlier, Ashley, about the legacy uh, of, of Swales. And, you know, the, the idea he sort of disappears from the main historical record. He's not part of that narrative, but I think a lot of historians have um, illustrated how individual acts by men like Swales during Reconstruction, that it is something that never left the African-American community. And that the idea, you know, suddenly it's the end of Reconstruction and it's now segregation, Jim Crow and lynching and all that certainly was there. And it mm -hmm. certainly was repressive, but it did not extinguish entirely black political action. So we have that idea. It's like into reconstruction. And, oh, then there's the civil rights movement. But, yeah. you know, rather if we look at what you've done and what others have done, it reminds us that Swales, in fact, was part of this, I would call it again, a revolutionary tradition. It reminds me of one of my favorite books, All God's Dangers. Have you ever read that? Yeah. It's a, it's an oral history of Ned Cobb, who was a Alabama sharecropper in the 1930s. And uh, it's a fascinating uh, oral history. And He's asked about his grandparents. His grandmother was a former slave and she told him, of course, not just about being a slave, but she told him a lot about reconstruction. And she reminded Cobb that she said that her, her grandson, he, she said, you know, the day's going to come, right, when the federal government will return and it will provide that degree of support uh, that we'll need, right, to be able to reassert ourselves politically. So, you know, those conversations, you know, uh, they don't, we're not recovered in that, that, that literary record, right? We don't see that. And so we then often think, oh, my God, it's just vanished. All the things that Swales had done and others had done during Reconstruction, poof, it's gone. Uh, when, in fact, there are great oral traditions, right, that carried on. I think that's what you were speaking to as well. I think that's important. Right. And just the, the formation of these communities, bringing people together, the, the, the physical mobility yes, of absolutely. Black people into certain sections of cities and, and towns, too, that they're still there today. Yeah. I think of, you know, in Richmond and Maggie yeah. Walker and yeah. Jackson Ward. Yeah. And obviously that, that story was not a straight trajectory to... To progress all the time it was up and down up and down yeah. but there was a community that that was planted there and it stayed there and they had their feet there through the hard times and the good times and they helped to advance uh to create ultimately good things not perfect things but good yeah. things in richmond well, and, and of course one big thing that has to be looked at with swales is at the end of reconstruction i mean he, he had done a lot also as a legislator uh, he the uh, education, uh, public education of the African American community was a big part of his his agenda. And the if you look at the education, the arc of education, it went up dramatically. And I've seen the figures on that. Uh, land ownership by white people by black people went up in South Carolina very strongly. A lot of that was taken away after Reconstruction, but it it, it was going up. Um, it was a you know there were some bad times there there was some corruption uh there were there were a lot of bad things that happened during reconstruction but the the arc of it was in by my reckoning very positive Absolutely. when it ended it ended with a bang uh and uh, it was like diving back into the dark ages the redeemers wanted basically to redeem what they had before the war uh, they knew they couldn't bring slavery back but they were looking for the next best thing basically to uh, stop african-american representation uh, political clout. Uh, and they did it in a variety of ways, some of which are very familiar with us today. Um, uh, redistricting, it was a big one. They basically ended up getting most of the black population in South Carolina into one district, the seventh judicial district, which was Charleston on down through Buford in that area. Um, and then all the other districts had a white majority. So basically the black population, even though they had a district, uh, didn't add up too much in the big picture. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I talk in my book about several of the different ways that they tried to uh, to basically negate the black vote. Uh, and then, of course, you go into Jim Crow. 
I mean, and that that rolls on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't really until the civil rights movements of the, uh, the, well, the 1950s, but particularly the 60s, that really started to pull things together. And by my reckoning, uh, we still aren't there. Right, right. Gordon, could you finish this off here, the, the other part of the question, and that is, so what is the, the current project that you're working on, or maybe you're in the early planning stages of something? I'm in the early planning stages. I'm looking at a variety of things. Um, I've had some people who like me who have made the argument that the Overland campaign didn't quite end on June 15th, that there were two or three more days of fighting before you can really say the mobile campaign was done. You can write a whole volume about that. Or, yeah, I, I don't know if I can do a battle study at this at this stage. I've gotten so interested in biography and 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 things like that. Uh, I'm interested in you know I was I lived in Ethiopia for two years. Uh, I was with the Peace Corps, lived in a, in a little mud hut in a uh, Ethiopian village. Got very interested in Ethiopian history, uh, and uh, I've been. I've always had in my mind I'd write a book about the British invasion of Ethiopia in the 1867 uh, 68 and the attempt to overthrow King Teodros, who had pretty much united the country. It makes an exciting story. I can tell you all about it sometime. Sure. Um, there's some great uh, original source material on that, both from the, from the British side. Uh, Lord Napier was in charge of that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's relevant today. God, Ethiopia had stability for so long. Absolutely, yeah. Ethiopia is in a is having horrendous yeah. pro problems from Tigray province. The fights. Anyway, um, that's a fascinating story. I'm also very interested. Uh, you know, I lived in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands for many many years. Um, we bought the Virgin Islands back in 1917 during World War One. It had been a Danish uh, colony for uh, about a century and a half. Um, and uh, there's a fascinating character, um, Governor von Scholten, who freed the slaves uh, in 1848 uh, without any permission from the main government. Uh, his mistress was a, a, a an African-American lady and uh, definitely had a major impact on him. Uh, and that's a fascinating story. Uh, I've there's some good source material on that, too. I thought about pulling that book together. Um, and there's others. Uh, you and I talked about one one time about uh, Alan Pinkerton. Pinkerton. And, uh, yeah. I'm, great biography. I'm still looking at that. Yeah, uh, be good. I'm still looking at that. And there's some good materials on that as well. Um, and uh, another another issue that I'm looking at that I think would be absolutely fascinating is going to be the, the uh, role of women in the American Civil War. Um, there were a lot more women who who uh, masqueraded as men uh, as soldiers uh, than uh, I think most people are aware. Uh, there were a lot of women spies operating in the Civil War. And then, of course, there's the ones we know about uh, who were the, you know, the nurses, and the medical people, and, and also people like, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman, uh, whatever, who served a variety of roles. But I thought that would make an interesting, interesting study as well. Uh, and uh, it's one that really hasn't been looked at uh, in any depth. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, well, yeah, I think you point to is what Ashley said about the power of micro history. That you know, a, a story like Swales is one that, as you point out, I, we can all agree, a story that needed to be recovered, a story that needed to be told. There are others out there, and it takes a little bit of digging. You were fortunate that all that research fell into your lap, and I'm glad that it did. Oh, wow. Ashley took a, a full advantage of it, and, and Gordon, it's, again, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And I love coming. The way that Gordon works, right? You know, he gets up at like four o'clock in the morning. He just chops wood for the hell of it. He doesn't even have a fireplace. Then he goes, he <laughs> runs five to 10 miles. He does like ultra marathons. I mean, he does. He does. You're still running. I, I aren't never you? know what to believe. I know. I know. When you go on these stories. So, Gordon, you're going to have to confirm. He, he does. Like, I don't think he does ultra, but he runs some serious. Uh, no, I'm, yeah, I, I'm still, still very much a runner. I love to do that. And I, I get up at five o'clock, not four o'clock. Okay. To right, chop so, wood? I, and I don't chop wood, no. No, I, I get up at five and I spend my first half hour to 45 minutes uh, looking at all the news and stuff like that. And I don't look at it anymore during the day. That's that's when I get my news fix. That's smart. That's smart. Catch but up on then, my emails. Yeah. But, you know, the very fact that you have a day job and that you're able to not just be productive, but able to do such high quality work is really astonishing to me. I, yeah. Let's see how I do after a year off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get 100 pages, you know, I'd be happy. well, I've I've always uh I've oh, always no, followed. No. I've always tried to follow the advice of my senior thesis advisor, and when I was a senior in college, uh, Robert Farrell, 
Yeah, yeah, he was your. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he was. I was in the uh, historian. Yeah. Okay, I was in the history honors program there at Indiana University. And uh, his his uh, uh, admonition was, he says, if you don't write something that's interesting, nobody's going to read it. So you shouldn't even bother in the first place. And what he would do, he made us write papers every week, and then he would spend more time looking at the language, it, make sure everything's in the active voice, yeah. uh, make sure that the sentences are short and tight and clean, uh, and make sure that this is engaging. And he said, and that's what he tried to to inculcate into us. And uh, so yeah. that's that's the mantra that I put in. When I yeah, finish well, the book, I go back 10 times, keep redoing it, keep okay. redoing the language, try to make it tight, clean, and fun to read. So, well, you know, my, my, yeah. my mom must have had feral at some point, and my mom's a Hoosier, and she said, when he said to you, my mom said something similar to me mm-hmm. after my recent book was published. She said to me, uh, Peter, when are you going to write a book that people will enjoy reading? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was tough, right? I got a two-star Amazon review. Maybe it was my mom. I don't know. Oh, it's hard, sad. Man. It's sad, isn't it? She really did say that. You think I'm making that up? She did. Yeah. And the other, the other advice I have to give you, Peter, and I follow up too, is, is that whenever I finish a book, I, I, my wife reads it and tells me if it's any good. And if it tells a story, then I know it works. And so, yeah, but she knows. You know, I'm very fragile. Right. So okay. she's, I, she sugarcoats a lot. She's smart. She's got to live with me, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got to work with me. I'm high maintenance, Gordon. There Is you she go. the one that cuts your hair? Hell no, man. No. I, go to, I go to a salon here in Gettysburg. It took some okay. time to find one, but I, I finally did. I finally did. Gordon, again, it's so great to have you on the show. Yeah, you look fantastic. And looking forward to having you up here at Gettysburg at some point. And, and actually, it's you know, um, Ashley, as Gordon, you might know, Ashley was my student at WVU, and um, unfortunately, I left before she finished. I was still on her dissertation committee, so I didn't take a little bit of credit for that. But man, it's great to be able to work with your former student. And of course, I can't even make it oh, great. as a colleague. I really, I so seriously, I've so enjoyed this. It's been great. It's, it's been really a lot of fun. And so, this is our last show for a while. I'm sure, you know, after my sabbatical, I'll be restored, refreshed. And, uh, and we'll, sassier than ever. Sassier than ever. <laughs> and we'll come back. And so for our folks at home, hey, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And everybody, please stay safe, right? And uh, enjoy your holiday season. Come to Gettysburg. I just want to give a quick ad for you. So tomorrow, oh, yeah, yeah. tomorrow, Ashley Lusky will be interviewing Harold Holzer. Mm-hmm. Can you tell the good people at home where they can find that? Yes. So this is an event put on by the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania, um, which is the group that uh, organizes Dedication Day on November 19th, the anniversary of uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And we do some other things as well. I'm on the board. But we have this quarterly series called A Conversation with a Lincoln Scholar, where we um, speak with various uh, historians who've written about Lincoln in different settings. Um, And tomorrow night is our fourth and final one of the year. It is streamed live from the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania Facebook page. All you have to go do is go on to the Lincoln Fellowship page on Facebook. There will be a link. It's going to be just like this through StreamYard. And you can follow. It's going to be a very similar format. Harold Holzer uh, will be discussing uh, the Lincoln image in popular print and culture. And he's actually going to be joined by Wendy Allen, who is a um, Gettysburg uh, She's not a native, but a Gettysburg yeah. resident. Yeah. Um, and she has painted Lincoln for many, many, many years. She's a leading Lincoln artist. And she's going to be discussing uh, contemporary yeah. uh, portrayals of Lincoln yeah. and her personal experiences yeah. as an So as now what time tomorrow? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Lincoln Fellowship. Lincoln Fellowship in Pennsylvania. Facebook. Facebook page, 7 p.m. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Hey, well, everyone knows Harold's fantastic. And so is Wendy. And of course, she'll yeah. have great questions. So I'm so glad that you're doing that. And then the last thing, another plug, we're here, man. Civil War Institute will be back and running in June, second weekend of June. Why don't you give us the dates there? For... <laughs> I always get that off. Yeah. The 11th Ooh, nice. through the 15th. Oh, no. Wow, oh, no. Wow. I can't remember off the top of my head. It's right the second week. It's the second weekend of yeah. June. We have Gary Gallagher, Brooke Simpson, Joan Waugh. Uh, help me out here. Wait a minute. Carrie Janey. Carrie uh, Janey's going to be there. Bill Blair, Jim Martin. Keith Bohannon, and you'll be giving a talk. It's a really good lineup, and uh, it's, seriously, it's filling up. So I hope you all will uh, send in your registration form soon. We'd love to see you in June. We did our 
conference uh, in October. Yeah. We did North Carolina at Gettysburg, and it was really, it was, it was great. To, it was wonderful. We yeah. saw so many uh, old friends that we hadn't seen for nearly two years and some new folks as well. So we're looking forward to seeing you all in person. Second weekend of June, Civil War Institute. Catch Ashley tomorrow night with Harold Holzer and Wendy Allen. And Gordon Ray is everywhere, out there running, chopping wood. Right, you're like Matlock out there writing books. You're doing it all, man. Hey, and you know, invite me back up to Gettysburg again someday. I hear they had a battle. I hear they had a battle up there. I don't know anything about it. It's just but, normal, uh, man. You could probably do four volumes just on Gettysburg itself. Hey, on the first day. Yeah, just on the first day. Yeah, you yeah. can do it. Gordon, take good care of yourself, buddy. It's great Thanks, seeing you. Everyone at home, take care. You got it. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.